Happy Easter. It's great to see you this morning and a great way to start off is to sing to our, our risen King. First time visitors, uh, we're, we're glad to have you with us and um, there's a couple things we want to ask you to do this morning. The first is if you're in this room, there's a, an information card in the seat backs in front of you. And you'll have the whole service to uh, fill it out. But at the end of the service, uh, when the offering plates come by, if you filled out that card, if you drop that in their plate for us, we greatly appreciate it. If you're in the East Worship Center, in just a second, I'm going to actually, we're going to recognize the visitor, and the ushers are going to give you that same card. So just hang on a second for that. Uh, first time visitors, another thing I'm going to ask you to do right now, because the folks around you just want to say hello to you. If you're a first time visitor, do us a huge favor right now. If you would lift up your hands so we can see you, and let's welcome these folks. Welcome one another this morning.
come today. If you could, please be seated. Well, happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. Happy Easter to all of those at all of our campuses here in this room in our East Worship Center um, online at the chapel at Lockport. Um, we've got a bunch of folks that are watching right now, so happy Easter to all of you. What I'm hopeful for is that this Easter holiday season, you have the opportunity to enjoy time with friends and with family, and that that all goes well and doesn't require any stitches. The reason I say that is because I've had a holiday season before where I was hanging out with um, family. We were actually at my grandparents' house in Decatur, Georgia, years ago. I was t about 20, 21 years old. And uh, just while we were there, the weather was nice, and some of my cousins were there, my brother was there, my sister, you know, just the whole family. So my brother, myself, and two of our cousins decided to go play some two-on-two -two football at the sandlot that was right across the street uh, from their house. And we were out there playing, and it was me and my cousin versus my brother and my other cousin. Me and my brother always like to match up on one another. I don't know if you've got siblings, if there's any of that rivalry going on, but that was going on for me. So I lined up as a uh, wide receiver. My cousin was a left-hander, threw a beautiful ball, and uh, I just took off running. I was going to kind of run a fly pattern, just a bomb, and, uh, and I took off. And here's, the, here's just the reality of it. I just left my brother like he was standing still, right? <laughs> He may potentially be watching online, and, and the truth is, right now at 42, I would still leave you like you were standing still. That's what I'm talking about. He's not even here to defend himself, right? It's just a cheap shot. I get it. But I took off. I mean, literally, I, I just, I gave him a little shake right there, and he bit, you know, left all his clothes right there. I mean, shoo, goodbye. So I was gone. My, my cousin, his name is Rock, R-O-C, seriously. Uh, it's his name, Rock. I mean, that's just a cool name, right? You got to be a dude if your name's Rock, right? I mean, it's like you don't name somebody Algae or something. So he just, he unloads this beautiful left-handed bomb. I take off running and I catch that thing, you know, like this. I caught it at full speed, turned around running full speed, holding the ball out to my brother like, get some of that, baby. Only to run into a cemented in the ground basketball pole backwards like this. Kaboom! Smashed my head into it running full speed, fell down into the ground, rolled around in the sand, was out for just a brief period of time. It, the long story short is my head had a gaping wound in it and they had to sew me up with a bunch of stitches. So the funny thing was, is that now every time after that, not so much anymore because I don't get my hair cut as short, but I was getting my hair cut really short at that time. Every time, you know, the, the hairdresser would start working on my hair, she'd be like, man, What's that? What happened to your head? And then I would tell her the story and kind of the moral of the story. Don't be a jerk, you know, <laughs> whatever, right? Don't be an arrogant idiot when you're playing against your brother in football. Here's the reality. Every scar has a story. Every scar tells a story. And some of those stories are pretty entertaining, like mine, and you probably have some too. And there's some folks in our church that have some reasonably entertaining scar stories as well. Take a look. My dad owns bowling shops. We were playing with fucking wheels, and she came back. I wouldn't give it back to her, so she turned on the switch. The switch turned the machine on, taking off two layers of my skin on my hand. I was um, running up a hill behind our house, and there was a big piece of steel attached to the house. I wasn't paying attention to where I was going. Smacked my head into this piece of steel. I thought for sure I was going to die. When I was four years old, me and my sister loved blocks. Just like this, we're chasing each other around the dining room table. I tripped and fell right on the block, went right into my forehead. So I was at a, a friend's house doing con some construction work. There was a pile of boards and nails and everything in the corner. I stepped on a board, slipped. <laughs> when I raised my arm, a board and nail came with it. It was in about that far. On the last full day of school, I ran into a janitor cart. I found out that I needed 12 stitches, and then four months later, I found out that I had a piece of wood in my foot still from the janitor's cart. When I was in sixth grade, we were riding bikes and we saw some of the boys from school. We decided we were going to race and catch them. My foot slipped and I start swerving and all of a sudden my face goes 
chin first into the pavement. For one minute, you're feeling like a cool teenage girl chasing boys on bikes, and the next minute, you're crying like a baby. I was making pizza for the kids, and the door of the oven was like on a spring, so it kind of like sprung shut and like just grazed my arm. I went back and I ate pizza, and then for a couple minutes, I was like, okay, no, that really hurt. So I looked, and it was like a huge blister on my arm. When I was a younger girl, I found a little piece of wood I thought I wanted to carve into the shape of a boat. The carving knife called me. One slip of the X-Acto knife, and it was gushing blood. I called for my mom, but she said, no, nope, no, nope, I told you not to do it. Go find your aunt. Thusly, the scar of disobedience was born. Being vain actually can be dangerous. For example, a comb. I cared for some reason I was vain. I missed, it's hard to miss your hair, but I did, and I, I clipped my forehead from right about here to here, and there are little tiny dots and sort of the line. So what I did is I learned to control the veinness and, and then to switch to a brush, which as long as you angle it properly, doesn't leave scars, even, even if you miss. <laughs> oh man. Here's the thing. Every scar tells a story, doesn't it? And I, I couldn't help but think when I was thinking about all of this, I, I know I'm dating myself here just slightly, but the truth is is that uh, even if you're my age or older or even younger, you've probably seen the movie Jaws. And if you remember when the lead characters were down below in the cabin of the boat and they just started talking and sharing war stories, and they started talking about all their, all their scars and stuff. Did you remember that? They were just all down there talking about their scars and the one guy, you know, he rolls up his sleeve and he goes, oh yeah, this is where I got bit by an eel and he's showing him this gnarly scar and the guy's like, that's nothing. And he picks his, you know, leg up, rolls his pant leg up, you know, and he goes, this is where I got hit by a shark right here and he's got this big old gash. And then I remember Richard Dreyfuss's character rips open his shirt and he's got this big old hairy chest, you know, rips open his shirt and he goes, you see that? And they all looked and they were going, no, what is it, a carpet? You know, I mean, like, he's like, no, you see that? And they, were, they couldn't see anything, right? And he went, Mary Ellen Moffat, she broke my heart. <laughs> you know, what's funny about that is that it resonates as so true to life. Because even though we have a bunch of scars on our bodies that we see, there are also scars that we don't see that we all carry around and every one of us probably has some that nobody else can see, but those scars tell a story too. But those stories aren't near as funny. Take a look at some of these. I used to be able to walk and had a nice life in a house with my wife and two kids. And then I got into an accident I had a couple of beers and dove into a pool and broke my neck. I have no feeling from the neck down. Since the accident, I can't do much for myself. My wife left me and that's about it. The final Sunday of my childhood church, I was sitting with my family in the back row and a man stood up and asked God to forgive a family in a church for sinning against that church. My sisters, my parents, and the rest of my extended family all got up in the middle of the prayer and left the church and never came back. By the time I was 14 years old, I had been through three church splits. I really didn't know what to believe about church. I didn't really know what to believe about people in the church because the people that were so nice to me before the service were also the people that were standing up in front of the entire church body and without naming names totally destroying my own family and we've paid the price for that. Hmm. The scars of those experiences still live inside of our hearts and we won't escape even though they've happened so long ago. Last summer um, my stepfather was in the hospital and he was dying and my mother had to take him off of life support. While we were waiting for the news I got a phone call from overseas. My father lived in the Congo 
and I hadn't seen him for over like five years, but um, I got a phone call that he had died. At 11 p.m. was when my mother called me to let me know my stepfather had died. And I had to wait until she came home to let her know that my birth father had died at 6 p.m. earlier that day. Um, so I had both my stepfather and my father die on the same day. And hard isn't really a word that you can use to describe the situation because it's, it's ridiculous is what it was. And the worst part of it is that I went to my stepfather's funeral but I couldn't even go to my own father's funeral. I still wake up and forget. I have dreams that they're both still alive, and then I have to wake up and realize that they're not there. And it's like reliving the whole thing all over again. So I don't really know how you grieve from that, but you kind of just get on with life, I guess. See, every scar, whether you see it or whether you don't, tells a story. And I know some of you are thinking to yourselves, man, Jerry, you know, it, it's Easter. Why the, why the theme about scars? Well, if you would just show some patience for me for just a second, I'm going to get you there. And I know this may be new for some of you that are uh, in this room or in the East Worship Center or watching online or at the chapel at Lockport, and you may not be associated with church too much or God too much, and this is kind of new for you. But I'll just ask you to hang with me. See, I... I'm, I'm really aware, um, contrary to what you may think, I'm really aware that Easter is about a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I know that full well. But what I also know is that for there to be a resurrection, there had to be a death. And that death was for a purpose that we'll talk about in just a second. But as you know, Jesus did die on a Friday. And when I say died, I don't mean anything other than no pulse, no heartbeat, no breath, died. And on Sunday, rose to life. That by itself is enough to just trip anybody out and make anybody scratch their head and go, what in the world is going on? You can imagine how some of the people that witnessed this thought as well. Because when Jesus resurrected from the dead, uh, the first person he ran into was a lady named Mary Magdalene. And when he ran into her, she didn't know who he was. She was thinking that he was the gardener. Now, what would you be thinking? You're not expecting to see a dead man, right, who's walking and who calls you by name. She didn't quite know what to make of Jesus, and so she runs into Jesus. She has a conversation with Jesus, and then she goes back and tells all of the disciples that she has seen Jesus alive. Now, they're thinking to themselves, we were just there on Friday. At least we were there for a little bit, and we did a lot of hiding, but they know what happened to him. They know that he was dead. The Romans, they were professionals at this thing. They knew when people were dead. And they crucified people so that they would die an excruciatingly long, torturous death. He was dead. And now Mary's saying he's alive? Some of the disciples took off, and they ran all the way to the tomb only to find it empty and realize that there were grave clothes that were just still laying in there, but they had not yet seen Jesus. So they come back amongst the rest of the disciples, and they end up gathering in a, in a, in a room because they're a little freaked out and a little scared. I mean, wouldn't you be? I would be. They're thinking to themselves, man, I don't know who's, who's going to come blame us for this. They're going to come say that we, his disciples, moved his body or took his body, and now they're going to come after us, and they're going to arrest us. We don't know if it'll be the Romans or if it'll be the Jews, but they're probably scared to death, kind of part anxious, part going, Mary, are you sure you saw him? Are you positive it was him? And then the other disciples chipping in going, well, we, we went. There's nobody there now, but they, it's just hard to process a guy who was dead who's not dead anymore. So that evening of the resurrection, they're gathered together and listen to the words of John chapter number 20. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. You know, isn't that an interesting statement that John makes it very clear to us that the doors were locked. Basically, they're in a room and they're sealed off. And Jesus just shows up. He doesn't knock on the door. They don't unlatch the door and let him in. He just walks in. How did he do that? I don't know. But I would have probably been freaking out. It's interesting that his first words were peace, right? Because I would have, everybody would have been going, ah! 
He just shows up in the middle of them. I mean, this is way better than back in the day with the honeycomb hideout guy who would just come blowing into that thing, right? Jesus just walks straight into the room and says, peace be with you. And they are probably absolutely freaking out. I would have been, I would have reverted back to elementary school and gone to the fire drill, you know, mechanics and started stop dropping and rolling at the, right at that time, right? I would, have, I would have been scared to death. And I imagine that they all were, but notice what happens next. They're not even sure who they're looking at and they're not sure what to expect. But then verse 20 says, after Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. And then the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Isn't it amazing that they identified Jesus by his scars? They, they didn't really know what to do with him at first. He shows up in a room and says, peace be with you. And they're like, yeah. And then all of a sudden, here's what Jesus does. He shows them his hands and his side, and then the Bible says they were overjoyed because now they saw that it was Jesus. It'd be a fair question of this text to ask this. Why did Jesus show the disciples his scars? Well, I think the first and most obvious reason is for proof, right? That would be the very most obvious reason because as you know, if you were standing there, you'd be thinking to yourself, how can I know that this is him? I just saw what happened to him, this gruesome death that happened just a couple of days ago, and now all of a sudden he's standing here among us and he shows them, hey, it's me. Because they're not, they're not expecting to see a dead man walking. And there was one particular disciple who wasn't with them in that particular gathering, and his name was Thomas. He wasn't around until a week later when they were gathered again, and Thomas had not yet seen him. And all the disciples are saying, hey, we saw him. We talked to him. He showed up in the middle of our room without, you know, an invitation. And Thomas said, well, I'd have to see the nail prints in his hands and see his side and see his feet. And of course he did, and he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Thomas, for you have seen and believed, but more blessed still yet are those who have not seen and yet still believed. So Jesus probably showed them the scars for proof. But I imagine there's probably another reason. And I think it's this. It's because every scar tells a story. And when you look into the scars of the hands of Jesus, you can make your way all the way back to the beginning of everything in its existence. Because the wounded hands that you're looking at are the hands that crafted everything that is. That made the universe, the stars, the solar system, every solar system, and then crafted in his own image human beings who bore the image, the thumbprint, the markings, the birthmarks of God. But those human beings decided to walk away from walking in a relationship with God and chose to walk their own way and maybe even chose to become their own gods, to make their own decisions, to do things independently of God. And as a result of that, sin entered in. This place of rebellion, whether it's active or passive, that stands in opposition to God. As a result, the first image bearers of God were cast out of the presence of God and they couldn't get back in because God posted a guard of angels there with flaming swords that said, there's no way to come back into my presence unless you go under the sword. And it left them in a precarious position because now they're cast out of the presence of God. So ultimately, what does God do? Well, God knows that in his holiness and in his justice, he doesn't just look at sin when we've missed the mark of God's standard of perfection. He doesn't just look at it and go, eh, Whatever, because God's holy, God's perfect, God is spotless, he is without blemish. And so people of stain are not gonna walk into his presence and just go, oh yeah, glad to be here, because they would be consumed by his holiness. But God is not also holy, just holy. His holiness also bears the marks of being completely and totally a God who loves. So God is a God of justice who is completely and totally holy, and God is a God of love, so much so that the scripture says that God is, in his very nature and character, God is love. So if God is holy and he will judge sin, and God is love, what happens then? What happens when the irrepressible justice of God meets the inexhaustible love of God? I'll tell you what happens. 
God takes the problem on himself because we could never take it on. So God, clothed in skin, named Jesus, is born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and ultimately went to a cross so that he could offer his life in place of your sinful one and in place of my sinful one, so that the justice of God could be poured out and satisfied totally and completely by a perfect sacrifice, namely Jesus. In so doing, he bore in his hands and feet these scars, and he rose from the dead, still maintaining them, and we see in his hands and in his feet and upon his side, we see the story of salvation being told. So when Jesus showed his disciples his hands, he understood that his scars tell a story. They tell the story of the salvation of humanity, that those who put their faith in Jesus can be transformed and changed forever. But I imagine that there may be Another reason that Jesus, when he showed up to his disciples, showed them his scars. Maybe he wanted them to look at his scars and see their scars swallowed up by his. And for them not to forget the cost of sin. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason he's got scars, and those reasons are our sins our sins, your sins, my sins. That's why he's scarred. This wasn't just some cosmic act of really cool supernatural magic that Jesus was going to say, hey, watch, I'm going to die and then I'm going to rise again. This was for sin, dying in your place and in my place. Here's why. Because in your sin, you are cast out from the presence of God and you have no hope of entering it again. The only way you get back into the presence of God is if you go under the sword and Jesus went under the sword on your behalf. He did it for you so that you by your faith in him could now be welcomed back into the presence of God. You see, the cost of sin is huge because those disciples that were standing around that day when Jesus showed up to them after the resurrection and showed them his hands and his feet and his side, they had scars of their own. Some of them had denied that they even knew he existed. They said, I, I don't know him. I don't know who you're talking about. Most of them absolutely didn't even show up when he was at his weakest moment. He was being crucified on, on a cross and they just checked out on him. The truth is though, if you and I were in that room, we would have the same things going on, wouldn't we? We're people with scars. We're people with sin. Every single one of us has been scarred by sin. And I wonder maybe if we looked into his hands, if we would see his scars and that they would say to us these words, my scars can swallow up yours. By my scars, my stripes, you can be healed. You can be made whole. You can be transformed. Everything can change. But you've gotta make a decision. Whether you're gonna hang on to doing things your own way or whether you're gonna turn and run into the arms of Jesus. My recommendation is this, when you see the hands that are scarred for you, you need to turn and run from your sin and run into the arms of the hands that were scarred by love for you.
Turning from us and we return to you. Father, heal your world, make all things new. Make all things new.
See, one of the beautiful things about scars is this. Scars are healed wounds. That's why it's brilliant that Jesus comes up out of the grave with a new, resurrected, glorified body, but still with a reminder in his hands and his feet and his side of what sin cost. But it was a reminder for us that when we look to him, we can know that our scars can be healed, that our wounds can be made better because of who he is. And it wasn't just that Jesus came up out of the grave and appeared to his disciples and you see these wounds, no. They carry on with him throughout eternity. Because when later, after Jesus had gone from them and ascended back to the Father, years and years later, the apostle John, from whose gospel we were reading just a moment ago, he gets an incredible vision, a revelation from Jesus. And listen to what John sees. In Revelation chapter five, verse six, it says, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. You see, even when we look into the contours of eternity, we will see forever the marks of what redemption's cost look like from the resurrected Son of God, a lamb who looks as if he has been slain. It's an awe-inspiring thing. And when we begin to understand the implications of the resurrection, the implications of what the scars of Jesus meant to us, his death on a cross as our substitute, dying for our sin, dying in our place for every hidden thing, every hidden action, every hidden motive, and every public one, everything we've ever done to offend God and offend everyone else, Jesus bore on himself the justice of God in your place so that if you put your faith in him, you wouldn't have to. But he didn't stay dead as just some great example where we go, isn't that sweet? He got up from the dead conquering sin, conquering hell, conquering death, demonstrating that his sacrifice was satisfactory to God and that he now as the first fruits from among the dead could now bring those of us who have faith in him to a new existence in this life and in the life to come. That's why it causes us to just stop and to praise and to worship him. And that is exactly what they're doing in the book of Revelation chapter five. It doesn't matter who they are, whether they're winged creatures or whether they're people or whether they're animals, everyone is resounding in worship and praise to the one who changes everything, the one who can make all broken things better, who can make all wrong things right, who can set everything back to where it was supposed to be and who can make everything new again, Jesus. Because there is only one name, there is only one person who can do that? And that is Jesus, the Son of the living God. Listen to what they say in Revelation 5. They sang a new song. And the song said, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever.
See, we need to be reminded this Easter that everyone scarred by sin can be made whole again by the God who was scarred by love. 
I wish that would land on you. You can be whole. You can be made new in this life and in the life to come by the God who is scarred by love, his love for you. His love for you took him to a cross, dying in your place, dying for your sin. His love for you brought him out of the grave as the first fruits of the resurrection that you can have hope not only in this life but in the life to come when we leave this life. But if you're here and you've never before put your trust in Jesus, I wanna say to you that you've never known anybody who's loved you like this and the gospel that I'm teaching you today means good news, but for there to be good news, there must be bad news. The bad news is, is that in the present state that you're in, if you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus, then you stand separated from God. And that life as you know it is in separation from God. It's not how God desires it. God doesn't desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, come to know him. But if you're here and you've never turned from your sin, turned from trusting in yourself, Turn from trusting in your ability to somehow navigate your way into his presence. You can't. You got to go under the sword. And you don't have the capacity to do it. Only Jesus did. He's done it on your behalf so that if you put your faith and trust in the resurrected son of God, you can find forgiveness of your sins. God, God will wipe clean your slate. And he will make you brand new. And he will give you hope in this life and in the life to come. So I'd ask you in the sensitivity of this moment, I know that there are some that under the sound of my voice in this room, in the East Worship Center, at Lockport, online, that this is your need. And I can't think of a better time than Easter, a better place than in a place gathered with people who are worshiping the resurrected Jesus for you to entrust your life to him. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Out of respect for the people around you, if you wouldn't move, that would be helpful. If you're here and you know in your heart that you want to give your life to Jesus, that you want to confess your belief in him as the son of God who died for the sins of the world, who died for your sins, who rose from the grave, and you've never really before in your life literally put your entire trust in Jesus your entire belief in him. I'm not talking about things that you've done, religious exercises in your past, you've gone to a class or you've attended a church before, or I'm not talking about any of those things. I'm not even talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship that comes by faith with God through his son, Jesus, who is the only savior of your life. If you're here and you know that that's your need and you want to receive Jesus, this morning as your Lord, as your Savior, knowing that he is the only hope, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, then maybe right where you're seated, you'd want to pray something like this in your heart. And you just repeat this silently in your heart to Jesus. Lord Jesus, I know that I've sinned and I've come short of the standard for my life. But I also know that you died for people like me. I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sin and to come live inside of me. I give everything that I am to you. I put my belief and my trust in you, believing that you died for my sin, that you rose again, and that you are living and listening to the words of my heart right now. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed still, and I'd ask out of respect you don't look around, but if you're in this room and you'd say, Jerry, I just prayed that with you and I meant it with all my heart. I'm not embarrassed about it, I'm not ashamed of it. Because Jesus said, if you're gonna be ashamed of me, then I'm gonna be ashamed of you. There's no, there's no, there's no such thing as being ashamed of Jesus. This is the son of God who created everything, who died and showed you love like you've never seen before. Being ashamed or embarrassed of him is just not consistent with what it means to be a follower of his. But if you're here and you'd say, Jerry, I just prayed that with you. I meant it with all of my heart. I wanna begin this journey. I wanna begin this relationship with Jesus. 
and I'm not ashamed of it. Would you all over this room and in the East Worship Center and at Lockport, would you just indicate that right where you are by just putting your hand up in the air real high? Indicate that before God. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Put it up high. Say, I'm not, I'm not scared of this. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not embarrassed of it. Because we're not looking for a religious exercise. We're not looking for secret disciples. We're looking for people who are serious about what it means by faith. Thank you. You can put your hands down. I'm going to ask you to do something brave. Because you know what? In the day and age that we live in, it's amazing how we can ask people and call people to significant acts of courage, but we don't ask them to be courageous in following Jesus. Well, not here. We want you to be serious. There's a, a pastor that's standing in the middle aisle, Pastor Daryl Largis. And what we would like to do, I'm gonna tell you in advance, no trick shots, no hooks. If you're one of those people who just prayed and you raised your hand and you said, hey, that's me. In just a second, while everybody else is just head bowed, praying for you, praying for people around them, I'm gonna ask you that just prayed that in just a minute. I'm gonna ask you to slip out of your seat in just a second when I let you know and meet Pastor Darrell right here and I'll tell you what's gonna happen. We're gonna take you into our fireside room which is right across the atrium. It's not like a cave. It's not dark and secret. We're gonna take you in there and we wanna have somebody pray for you and we wanna send you home with something that's gonna help you in your journey of faith, teach you more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You're not joining the church. You're not on the hook for anything. You don't have to stand up and sing a solo. You don't have to recite the entire Bible. We just wanna help you. We wanna be an asset to you. But I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you to be bold. And I'll be honest with you. Can I just be honest? Listen closely to what I'm saying to you. I know it sounds like a big act of courage to step up in front of a lot of people and then come and stand with this pastor and then make your way out. But I want you to know something. You're in here with a bunch of fans. They're, you're in here with family. They love Jesus. And if you're choosing to love Jesus as well, they're gonna be fired up about that. It's not like you're walking in front of a bunch of people who hate Jesus, right? This is the easiest place in the world to follow him. If I'm just being gut level honest with you, this is, it doesn't get easier than this. It's when we walk into a world that may say, hey, I don't, I don't wanna hear your Jesus talk. I don't wanna hear anything about him. I'm gonna do things my own way. That's when it's tougher. But this, let's be real. This isn't asking a whole lot. So if you're one of those who just a moment ago, I saw you all over the room, lots of you. You lifted your hands and you said, I just, I prayed and I invited Christ into my life. I wanna begin that relationship with him. I'm gonna ask you wherever you are to boldly, courageously, Ask people to excuse you. They'll be glad to do it. And step right out here in the middle aisle with Pastor Darrell. If you're over at the East Worship Center, there's a pastor over there who will let you know that. The chapel at Lockport, Pastor John Drake is gonna let you know that. Go ahead, right now, wherever you are. Somebody, to, somebody be bold enough to lead. God bless you guys. Just come stand with him right here. Wow. Come on out. bless you folks. We'll wait just another moment if some of you want to join him and, I'll, and then he's going to take you out in just a half second. Uh, I, I want to say this. One of the things that I'm real encouraged of, and I'm seeing it right here in this room, I can't see the other rooms, but right when I said that, and, and this, this just gets to the man inside of me, so you, ladies, you just have to forgive me for a minute. It was seven or eight men who stood to their feet and led the way. That gets to something inside of me. The reason I say that the reason I say that is because oftentimes women are more apt to respond and sometimes men just sit there and, and kind of wrestle in their pride. I know, I'm one. We just wrestle in our pride. It's so, it fires me up to see men stand up and be counted for the cause of Christ. And by the way, it fires me up to see women. 
and it fires me up to see kids. Amen. And if there were animals that were showing up, I would be fired up, all right? So I'm gonna ask Pastor Daryl if you'll make your way out with this group and let these folks know in all of the rooms, let them know how excited we are for them. Thanks so much. Be seated. We just have a, a couple of things to do before we walk out the door. And our ushers are taking their places right now in all of our um, worship areas. And what I'm going to ask of you is quite simple. Um, if you're a regular attender, member of the chapel, you call this place home, whatever that looks like, you've got an opportunity to give. And some of you want to give your regular giving. That's great. You do that in the regular envelopes. But let me say this. Some of you inside of your worship folder, you saw an Easter offering envelope. If you put anything in that envelope, we're giving it away. It doesn't stay in house. Those who give their regular giving, you go ahead and give that. But those things that go in the Easter offering envelope, if you're writing a check, you can just make it to the chapel. Um, all of that's gonna be given away. And let me tell you where it's going. Because we're so concentrated here at Easter on the gospel, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his resurrection and his death for our sins and the power that that has to transform people's lives like this morning, we want to invest in a couple of avenues that are gonna propagate the gospel in larger scale. Here's the first. Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, is coming to our area in the Rock the Lakes Festival. And we as a church wanna be a part of joining with hundreds of other churches in our region to give an incredible gospel witness to Western New York. And so a part of this offering is gonna go help, is gonna help facilitate this actual festival that's gonna be going on in September for the glory of God and to see men, women, boys, and girls touched with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The other part, let me tell you this, this fires me up too. Here's where the other part of the offering is gonna go. As you know, as a church, four or five years ago, up until four or five years ago in the history of our church, which is 51 years old, we had never planted a church ever. We've now been a part of facilitating the planting of 10 or 12 churches just in the last number of years, being serious about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we are parents to a number of churches, but we're about to become grandparents. Two of the churches that we help to facilitate the planting of in partnership are going to be planting other churches. Isn't that exciting? So, we're gonna do what good grandparents do. We're gonna dote on them. We're gonna love them. We're gonna give them some stuff and help them facilitate this process. So anything in the Easter offering envelopes, that's where it's headed. Your regular giving, you can give. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray and we're gonna distribute these plates. If you're a guest, you can put uh, that guest card that Benji told you about at the beginning of the service, put it in there and make that your gift to us. We'd appreciate it. And when I say amen and the plates are passing, you're gonna see a promo for what I'm gonna be teaching starting next week in the next four week series. And I think you'll wanna pay attention. Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity to invest in kingdom things. And thank you for these that have entrusted Jesus, entrusted their lives to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Use what we give for your glory so that others may hear and believe in Jesus' name, amen. Take a look. There's a lot of things that we just don't understand. The tax code. Anything Bob Dylan ever sang. Um, and the existence of the New England Patriots. <laughs> but what about bigger issues? Things that really matter. Join us for our new four-week series beginning next Sunday called I Don't Understand as we explore things like I don't understand why evil exists. I don't understand how the Bible and science can get along. I don't understand why God killed Jesus. I don't understand what happens to people who've never heard of Jesus. Beginning next Sunday, 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. at the Crosspoint campus and 10 a.m. at the Lockport campus. 
So taking on some big questions, and I decided this would be a good idea for a series, and then I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask the other people to talk. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm actually going to do it. So we're going to try and tackle some of these big questions, all right? So bring some people with you. Maybe if those are uh, questions of interest to you, uh, we're going to be tackling some of those in the next month. Now, a couple things that I want to say to you. Number one, I am really, really appreciative um, that you are here today and that you brought maybe friends or family alongside of you and thank you for showing Jesus great love in your worship of him and friends and family great love by your inviting of them to come with you and we thank God for those who've responded in faith. Secondly, I thank God every day I am so grateful to get up and come to work at this place and to serve you folks and to serve alongside of people like you. It is an honor and a privilege for us to be associated with the people that we call the chapel. We de deeply and desperately love you folks. Third thing, maybe you're not used to coming to church very much at all. Maybe this is brand new to you. Welcome. We're really glad you're here. Here's what you found out. The roof didn't collapse. We're reasonably normal. And we'd love to see you next week so that you're not a stranger, but you start showing up a little more often and get to know this God that we love and that we serve. I'm hopeful that every one of you is gonna have a really, really happy Easter and that you're gonna enjoy your time together with friends and family without any stitches. <laughs> happy Resurrection Day. God bless you. You're dismissed.